Hey everyone, this is Moderate Rebels. I'm Ben Norton. My co-host Max Blumenthal and I did a lengthy live stream with the journalist Yasha Levine. This is part two of our discussion, which you can listen to as a podcast or watch on YouTube. And in this section, we talk about Russia, Russian politics, and the candidate, the rather the political figure that many of you have probably heard of, Alexei Navalny. He is all over the Western corporate media. Western governments have been openly supporting him as one of the leading voices in the opposition to Russian President Vladimir Putin. So we talk about who is Alexei Navalny. Yasha Levine was born in the Soviet Union, and he spent a lot of time living and working in Russia. He knows the country very well. So we talk with him about Russian politics, about what's actually going on in the country in terms of the power struggle between Russian oligarchs, and the actual politics of Alexei Navalny. And, you know, this is a guy with a, and a very xenophobic, racist history of right-wing nationalist politics. We, we look into that. We talk about his neoliberal economic philosophy. And Yasha discusses his, the, the fact that Alexei Navalny has his own oligarch backers and how he doesn't actually represent in any way a diverge from the neoliberal consensus, but rather he represents another faction of the Russian oligarch class. So without further ado, here is our interview with Yasha Levine. I'll never apologize for the United States of America, ever. I don't care what the facts are. Why are we going to sit down and talk to these quote-unquote moderate rebels? Who are the truly moderate rebels? The search for the moderate rebel. Do these moderate rebels exist? Moderate rebels. I want to transition a bit, and I want to talk more about Russia and and Alexei Navalny because we were looking at Yasha Levine's Substack. I would highly rec- recommend that "Immigrants as a Weapon," and he has a really good piece looking at uh, uh, Alexei Navalny's oligarch backer. But before, I, I think an interesting transition actually is that you you were talking about how this weaponization of immigrants, you know, Max mentioned that it, during the Cold War, this was like a key propaganda point against the Soviet Union. And I think what's really interesting now is that one of the groups that came out of that initiative, the Victims of Communism <laughs> Memorial Foundation. He looked like he's sig heiling. Yeah, well, this is the Victims of Communism Memorial Foundation, which was founded by the Ronald mm-hmm. Reagan administration. It was backed by the U.S. government. It, it has it has praised far right figures in Eastern Europe. In fact, it is funded by the far right Polish government, and they, when Trump was in power, You're by course, supporters were- of the Duda government. I just like to actually correct you. It yeah. was signed into law uh, by Bill Clinton, the, the victor- victims of Communism Memorial Foundation. Ah. It started yeah. under Reagan, but it was signed into law under Clinton, yep. right? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, well, I, I don't know when it exactly started, but like the it was the the whole thing is to build a memorial to you know the victims of communism. I mean, uh, like a but statue. But yeah, yeah. But go ahead. I mean, it's a minor point. Well, yeah, no. Well, I mean, it's interesting. I mean, it's totally bipartisan. And and what's also interesting is that the vic- they were praising Trump specifically because in 2017 there was this photo op that was staged by the Victims of Communism Memorial Foundation, which is a key example of this weaponization of immigrants where yeah. the head Marion Smith in 2017 went to the White House and met with Trump in the Oval Office. This article here is actually from the Epoch Times, which is the propaganda arm of Falun Gong, which is this extremist, fascistic Chinese cult. And at this meeting, there was a, a Vietnamese person, a Cuban person, a Polish person who was a member of the U.S. State Department, and also a Chinese person. And they were all representing like these countries that are supposedly these horrible hellscapes and that they're repressed by. And and Victims of Communism was one of the main groups behind that. I I mentioned that because of course now, you mentioned early on of of how similar these narratives are to the narratives about Xinjiang and China and the Uyghurs. Well, who, who is the main person of course, pushing this line of Chinese genocide? It's a senior fellow at the Victims of Communism Memorial Foundation, Adrian Zenz. And anyone who's interested in this at, at the Gray Zone, we've done a lot of reporting on Adrian Zenz and his extreme right-wing views, his Christian extremism. But, I mean, very much what, what Max and Yasha were talking about, about the weaponization of 
accusations of anti-Semitism in the Soviet Union, many of which were extremely exaggerated. I mean, those the yeah. same kind of tactics are now being used with Uyghurs yeah. in China. I mean, it's it's the same tactics repeated over and over again. No, and you're, same, you yeah, you, you've done. Yeah, you've done great people. reporting on this. Yeah, you've done great reporting on this. And exactly one thing that I was just when I was looking at the this um, Israeli campaign to, you know, influence the Amer American Jews and get them to believe that there was an imminent Holocaust against against Jews in the Soviet Union. Um, you know, like I was like, it's like it's 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 it was so similar to what's going on with the with the Uyghur genocide campaign. I mean, because both of them, you know, take what what is essentially a kernel of truth, right? I mean, uh, that there is. In, in the Soviet Union, that there is some repression against uh, and discrimination against Soviet Jews. I mean, it's a fact. My it affected my dad. You know, he couldn't get into a uh, university of his choice because of these kind of hidden quotas that existed. Um, I mean, they were uh, even like when my parents had to go went, went and took a vacation overseas once, and you know, or not even overseas, but like a foreign vacation in Bulgaria. Uh, they had to leave me as a hostage because they were because <laughs> they were Jews and they were considered a flight risk. And so, you know, my mom, my dad, and my brother went. And I was left behind in the Soviet Union as 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 like as just a bag of money, uh, you know, just to, to hold there. And so, you know, that kind of stuff existed in the Soviet Union. It wasn't extreme, um, uh, especially you know after Stalin's death, the Soviet the anti-Semitism was extreme, but it existed. You know, and so you take a kernel of truth of some repression, some discrimination that exists, and you blow it out of proportion, right? And you and you and you make it into something you know that it isn't, which is uh, a coming genocide. And I and I saw a kind of a you know similar. A totally similar, uh, similar thing going on with, with what's going on with with the Uyghur population. Although it's it's extremely hard to know actually what what is actually going on down uh, over there. Uh, and the, the only information that you really get is from people like Adrian Zenz, right, uh, and other Uyghur groups. So yeah, I totally agree with you. Yeah, I mean it's the same exact same institution that it's one of the main institutional drivers of this, but. And this is also a segue, I think, that we can talk about Russia, what's going on, because, Yasha, you also have spent a lot of time in post-Soviet Russia, and, and you have you were at the Exiled, which which helped document the kind of period of the Yeltsin years with, with your colleague Mark Ames, a friend of the show, and just documenting the horror that many Russians lived through and people in former Soviet republics lived through of the neoliberal shock therapy and and just the implosion of their society. And, you know, since then, since that, that Yeltsin honeymoon, which was not really a honeymoon, I mean, it was an awful dystopian period, and, and the rise of Putin, we've seen the same kind of new Cold War rhetoric, even though, of course, Russia is very far from being socialist like it was in the Soviet Union, there's still the same kind of rhetoric. And we, we see, just yeah. as with the Soviet Union, there were, there were weaponized dissidents. And we see now the weaponized Russian dissidents like... Alexei Navalny. So, it, yeah. I mean, anyone who's watching this has probably heard Alexei Navalny's names and name, and he's just constantly now in the media, twenty four seven. You wrote a really good piece. Say hello to Alexei Navalny's libertarian multimillionaire backer. So, I mean, talk about who Ale Alexei Navalny is, and and your take on. I mean, this the media hagiography is absolutely incredible, portraying him as like this Jesus like figure who's being repressed by Putin, who's a like, mustache twirling villain yeah i mean look I, you know navalny alex navalny is a is a genuine uh phenomena you know like um you know despite the fact that he's being kind of weaponized by by various american and sort of imperial organs and they're using him as a way of you know basically destabilizing russia and trying to overthrow putin and all this stuff i mean he is a real domestic phenomenon you know he is he might not you know like he is, he's he's a re, he's the real deal um and um and and like and so and he has he's a he's a strange he's a strange kind of character because he's um he he, he merged um he he got his politics uh, started getting into politics and kind of the, the nationalist sort of uh, spectrum of, of of russian politics um and um he was involved with these russian liberal uh um political parties uh, at the very beginning as well. And so he comes out of this nationalist liberal uh, milieu uh, in, in, in Russian politics. And he's only in the last, you know, I don't know, five years has he really um, become, become really big. But I, I, I don't know if I would, I wouldn't, I wouldn't necessarily put him into the category of like a weaponized emigrate. Uh, I mean, obviously 
America will weaponize any dissident that it that it thinks it sort of will will will, will um, destabilize the country that was the target. So so I don't know if I would put him in, you know in, in, into the into the category of like a total. Yeah, you would have to now. I mean, that's what the poisoning was about, or the alleged poisoning was about. Was I mean that transition from being sort of a legitimate domestic political for, he wasn't maybe the most popular candidate but his youtube videos were viral he was you know hitting on a real theme of discontent against corruption yeah now he's i mean w w what is he but you know he he's lost all, all domestic credibility that i can be based on well no i just i disagree with you actually because i think you know i mean just from people that i know in russia that have supported him over the years and keep supporting him now he hasn't lost any credibility in their eyes um he's seen um, he's, it's it, easy for the kremlin now to paint him as yeah well cia asset because what he went over to germany and did and how course, he's course, returned yeah. and embraced the support of the us and you have you know, these figures behind him, like a Shirkoff who are playing the real role of the Western back dissident in from the UK. So I think yeah. that, that, that there has been a transition in his career from or his trajectory from what he was to what he is now. And the turning point to me was the poison. Well, look, so, I mean, I guess it's like this. It's like there's there, you, you look at you, you look at this, this from two different sides, right? You can turn to look at it from the internal side, the, the Russian side, the Russian politics side, and you look at it from the sort of the external side and the, the, these two things sometimes match up sometimes don't match up I, I don't think that that to um you know to people that i've spoken to and and what i've just seen in terms of just my, my friends and their support for him um in in this in russia um is that like the fact that he's being helped in some way by by western governments doesn't disqualify him in their eyes i mean because they see it as like a kind of a, a fight against their own elites and so they don't really give a shit what where he gets the help right in order to to fight the sort of the the battle that they that they uh, you know are fully on board with and so to them it, it's the same thing it was it would it, like would it discredit someone if they you know got some help from the chinese government you know and, and depends on what your politics are in, in america like if you're an american politician and you got some help from the chinese government let's say um, I mean, it would discredit maybe you in someone's eyes, but not in everyone's eyes. And so, to, so I mean, so I, I totally understand. I mean, the, his level of support and the, the kind of the 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 support that he's been getting from the American the American Empire has been ratcheted up uh, since the poisoning, and he's been a, a lot more willing to openly take help from them because he's basically has no other option at this point, right? He's being kind of forced out of the country, um, and and so he's almost being forced into this ex into exile, right? And he's come back and he's obviously, you know, immediately jailed. Um, but it's pretty clear that the Russian government is trying to force him out. And, and he's much more open about taking foreign help. Uh, and it, it's and his his uh, sort of closest lieutenants are, you know, li living uh, or, or spending most of the time or f fully uh, living uh, in the in the European Union. Uh, and and doing, so uh, calls with NATO ministers, to, you know, exactly, ratchet up exactly. sanctions, do the sanctions more intensely. You know? Yeah. Well, and then and then Yasha, there's this leaked video that shows uh, a British operative who is very likely representing MI6, in which a an assistant of Navalny yeah. calls for ten to twenty million uh, sure. dollars. Yeah. yeah. No, that was from some years ago. Um, that was from some years ago. Yeah. And I mean, I, I don't know. It's hard for me to to know what to make of that video. Like I, it's it's like <laughs> it's so it's so open and so brazen to be talking about this stuff in 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 a in a, in a crowded restaurant. Um, surrounded by all these people that like, I also like wonder if this guy's like a double agent or something. I have no, I have no information on this stuff, but I, I look, I mean, the fact that, um, the West wants to aid of Navalny and the wants to, and wants to, um, sort of use him in order to, uh, destabilize, uh, Russia. I mean, it's a fact. And so, and so he's been, he, what's I think changed, uh, in, in, in a huge way is that he's been a lot more, um, open about um working with the west and basically working with you know partnering with bellingcat i mean that's the biggest thing i mean partnering on an investigation with bellingcat right to uh expose his um supposed poisoners and to expose this operation the, the fsb uh, operation to poison him i mean the fact that he's openly working with those guys is the you know a clear sign that his he's no longer very he's no, no longer very cautious or doesn't even care anymore that he's seen as a as a as a western puppet or whatever it is you know but that doesn't matter to his supporters you know inside russia i mean i think it's an important thing to point out like you know we look at it from from our perspective which is that we're sitting in america we're fighting against our our horrible fucking empire you know our destructive empire and so to us the, his support 
uh, the support that he gets from America and from American imperial organizations, you know, is problematic. And, and, and we don't think, you know, that our government should be doing that. Right. But from the other side, they, they see it in a different way. I mean, so they see this Navalny as someone who could bring stability to Russia, change politics, who will, you know, revitalize Russia, get rid of the crooks and the, and, and all this stuff and, you know, get rid of corruption, all the stuff that he promises. I don't think he will actually deliver on those promises, uh, but it has not discredited him uh, to the people who support him in Russia. And those, and, and that's a lot of people who do support him, you know, like some, some people overtly, some people, uh, you know, like not so overtly. And he has a huge amount of support among the elite. Uh, he gets a lot of money from Russian uh, elite and that are actually pretty close to the Kremlin. Um, he gets a lot of support from America, the, 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 the urban professional class, uh, a lot of support from the Russian tech sector, uh, a lot of support from uh, Russian sort of uh, small business owners and this kind of entrepreneurial class that owns, you know, cafes, that owns like clothing stores. That he gets he has a lot of support that's very organic. And the fact that, you know, Bellingcat has released this report with him and he's worked with Bellingcat, this obvious you know, intelligence asset. Um, does not uh, diminish their uh, belief in him or support of him because they actually think that Bellingcat is doing great work. You know, so I just I just want to look at it from that from that from their perspective, even though I don't agree with their perspective. You know, uh, but it's valid because it's uh, so it's like who, who the credit Navalny's credibility in whose eyes you know um, his credibility depends on who's actually looking at him and from what perspective. Well, so, well, Yasha, can you yeah. talk about who those those Russian liberals who support him are and what their politics are? Because, I mean, you, you said that to them, it probably doesn't matter that he gets Western support because a lot of them are pro-Western neoliberals. And, and of yes. course, for listeners, when, when people say Russian liberals, it's not like the U.S. I mean, they are liberals, but like the, the term liberal in the U.S. has been so distorted, like liberal in the context of Russia refers to what we would call neoliberals. Or like a or like a classic liberal, yeah, like a like a yeah, exactly a neoliberal or like a libertarian even would be a closer, maybe even uh, yeah. So a Russian liberal is closer to would be a libertarian, meaning that they, um, you know, like economically they are for free markets, they're for um, introducing markets into every sector of society. Uh, yeah, so what people would sort of refer to as neoliberalism in America uh, or libertarianism. Um, I mean, on the social side, you know, they run the gamut from like you know being conservative and, and to being you know. Uh, pretty liberal in their in their social views about let's say gay rights and things like that. Um, I mean the people that support him it's, it's an interesting it's an interesting question. Um, he gets a lot of support from um, um, again this upper tier kind of I guess you would call it like the petty petite bourgeois class uh, uh, in in, um, in in Russia that's like that supports that really is not like part of the full-on power structures, the oligarchic power structures, and they're sort of on the, on, on, the, on, the, on the fringes of it, but are still doing pretty well. They have businesses, sometimes very successful businesses, and they um, are against sort of this, the, the, the clans that run Russia and that run Russia like it's, it's their personal fiefdoms. They take what businesses they want. You know, they like basically do these corporate raids where they can like take away your business or force you to sell out, you know, your stake um, if, 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 they, if, they, if they want to grab it. So there's like a lawlessness that they are that they oppose, and so they see Navalny as promising to restore a kind of a, you know, rational uh, market-based order that isn't corrupt, that isn't based on these patronage networks that uh, of the, uh, that the Kremlin operates. And so he gets a lot of support from people. I mean, he, from the like huge sect parts of the urban population support him. Um, people, you know. Uh, people in the tech sector, like I said, people in who run small businesses, um, even in these kind of close to the oligarchy segments that are still kind of against this oligarchic uh, uh, patronage uh, system that isn't about you know free markets that it, it doesn't function on the basis of of markets. They, you know they're against it. So um, even people close to the Kremlin still support him. Um, so, so there's a so there's a wide, um, a, you know, a wide array of people, and all of them want, you know, for Russia to be run on a on a kind of a on a market basis, you know. So they're all they want a, they want they think that he will restore a kind of neoliberal, um, um, I, you know, order to the country, and so, so he, yeah, it's hard to pin him down as a 
Yeltsin character. I mean, he did support the annexation of Crimea. He kind of understands that you can't give up all of Russia's national interests. But at the same time, he was a Maurice Greenberg fellow at Yale alongside figures like Carlos Vecchio, who's Juan Guaido's fake ambassador here in Washington. Yeah. Maurice Greenberg is a veteran CIA asset. He was once proposed to be CIA director. He's also kind of a financial criminal who founded AIG and helped fuel the uh, housing crisis, um, the housing bubble. And uh, I found a tweet by Navalny. I mean, there's so many good Navalny tweets where he uh, is uh, part of the program. And he said, now we're about to go into a seminar uh, to meet Ma Maurice Greenberg, the financial criminal from AIG. I think he just called him a straight up financial That's pretty criminal. funny. <laughs> he's in the program and being cultivated. Um, so... He yeah, he he's you know Navalny is an interesting character. He's a very he's a very Russian you know like if you know Russia like he's he exudes a kind of Russian mujik vibe like a Russian manliness you know he's a very man of the people. He I mean part of the reason why he's so successful and and he comes out of this liberal sort of nationalist oriented liberal world or neoliberal world is because he's he's one of the few people in that world that's kind of manly and 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 can and can speak the same kind of language as as the, as the people you know whereas the rest of the people the rest of um that world is very academic very kind of spineless yeah. you know uh kind of puny and, and wimpy he is like i mean he what, the first time that i actually even uh her, kind of heard his name and started looking at him is when he uh at, at, a, at a debate between these liberals in um in moscow uh, i think it was in, in the summer of 2007 he actually like some he, some guy was like heckling him he shot him you know he shot him with he shot him with this um uh, basically, it's like a real gun, but it has rubber coated bullets. And he, I mean, he shot him point blank in, in the face. And um, and apparently it was one of the reasons why they got into in an altercation is because um, the guy that he shot like was from from Central Asia or the Caucasus and he called him a racial slur. And so they got into a, you know, a fight. And so he whipped out a gun and he shot him. And so he's he's like a pro guns, right? The guns, uh, guns, guns rights um, guy. And uh and he carried a pistol with him. He like recommended that everybody carry a gun on him at all times. Um, so he's like this, and and you know it it turned off a lot of people. But at the same time, like um, Russia is a very macho culture uh, where you do kind of have to protect yourself. It's it's a, you know it's kind of a dangerous place. So um, so people gravitate to him, and he really stands out from that world. And and so he has a natural appeal, and he does he does he's fearless, and he's um, I mean, uh, he's like, he's the only, I mean, he, I don't know. He's like, he's, uh, so he gets support from the West. I don't deny that, but, but he's also like a, um, a very organic sort of, uh, creation of, of, of Russian political culture. And, uh, he has yeah. organic support. I mean, I don't know, you know, if you, so if you, if you, if you take away all the Russians, all the American support that he's gotten, what would happen to him? Um, well, it's not about, question. It's not yeah. about that. It's more just, you know, just what does the what what is the US trying to do here, how he's being used, how he's rolling with the whole thing. That's more what I'm totally. interested in. But you raised you raised an issue here that's like defined the whole discussion of Navalny for the past two or three weeks that we should go into, which is that yeah, he cultivated a lot of domestic support by uh, being a nationalist, by calling for Getting the mi getting rid of the migrants from the stands, you know, being he's made anti-Jewish comments. I think he's made anti-gay comments. Yes, yeah. I, I, I'm not as you know, I don't speak Russian, so maybe there's some linguistic issue uh, nuances I'm not picking up on. But it seems like he was saying things that would offend any you know liberal in the West. And so what ultimately happened was Katya Kazbek did a a Twitter thread. Yes. <laughs> on how he's just for years been saying things that went even further than Trump about immigrants and Jews and everyone else. Uh, basically yeah. just stuff that it would be seen as ultra nationalist right wing unacceptable in the liberal West. And so amnesty international yanks his prisoner of conscience designation, which I always thought was a joke anyway. And they have Leopoldo Lopez, this right wing Venezuelan oligarch, who's been leading military coups as a prisoner of conscience. I mean, why is he still listed there? And Julian Assange is not 
or and, yeah. and and Chelsea Manning not listed as a prisoner of conscience. I was trying to find out like if so, are any American uh, you know people in American jails prisoners of conscience. Is there a single one? Like I don't even think. Are you aware of one? Because I couldn't hear Mumia. Like they're not really touching yeah. that. They barely, remember J twelve when all the here. all yes. those kids were arrested for protesting Trump and like they broke like a Starbucks window or something. Like I'm not like a big fan of the protest or whatever, but like the human rights and then all these journalists, including our friend Alex Rubenstein, they were put on trial. They were facing years in prison just for covering what took place. Yeah. Amnesty and Human Rights Watch didn't say a goddamn no thing about yeah. that. So I was just like, you know, if only they were in Russia or Venezuela. So it's like the international. Well, you know, actually, uh, here, yeah. Yasha, this this answers your question. Here, here is Amnesty International. Amnesty International has investigated the case of Leonard Peltier, who's a, a Native American and uh, political prisoner. And they say really quickly here, Amnesty International has not adopted Leonard Peltier as a prisoner of conscience, although they remain concerned about the fairness <laughs> of the proceedings leading to his conviction and believe that political factors may have influenced the way in which his case God. was prosecuted. That says everything about the priority. But it's such a, yes, yeah, the, the prisoner of conscience is such a liberal uh, label because it's like if you advocate for violence, you know, or any kind of violence, even if it's righteous violence, right, against, you know, an oppressor. Like if you're if you're a Jew in the, like the Jewish ghetto in a, in a ghetto and you're you know doing like the Warsaw Ghetto uprising, like yeah. you, they, you wouldn't be able to be a prisoner of conscience because you advocated for violent uprising against or, Nazis, you know. Or the Gaza so like, ghetto. I mean, I mean, all of the Palestinians. Exactly. So many of the Khalida Jarar. Why she's never? Why is she not going to be listed as a prisoner? She's going to jail for another two years. She's always in jail for resisting yeah. uh, Israel's you know administrative detentions and everything they're doing and she she's affiliated with the pflp so they're not going to list yeah. her but well, uh well, yeah, I, I do have to say it's true i mean that, that hypocrisy is true but at the same time as max mentioned amnesty and human rights watch claim that leopoldo lopez is a prisoner of conscience but he has he has not only called for he has organized numerous violent coup attempts and and <laughs> leopoldo lopez according to the wall street journal <laughs> they admitted that he was one of the key figures behind the failed invasion in in last in 2020 so yeah and they didn't I mean, they, they haven't rescinded they support some violence they that's haven't funny, rescinded but let me that's ask funny. you i mean let me yeah. try to ask two semi-provocative questions i mean what what it should prisoner of, must prisoners of conscience have liberal views or is it possible to be a prisoner of conscience if you hold racist or xenophobic views and question number two who, how can we say that Navalny is not guilty of the charges he's accused of in Russia? I mean, there's plenty of people who claim, and I, I haven't gone into detail enough that these aren't cooked up charges. I mean, aside from evading parole like 80 times and going abroad, which I could have never done yeah. in this country, he has run these anti-corruption foundations and they're accused of embezzlement. And I mean, you look at the video of a Shirkov and this MI6 agent, he's asking for $20 million. I mean, there's all kinds of. I mean, look, there's in, 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 on, mean so. that, like, you know, money laundering and stuff like I mean, these, there's so much of this stuff happening in Russia that the way that it get, the law gets applied, obviously, is. It's in, unequal. In this, yes, it's <laughs> hypocritical. I mean, I think it's pretty political, you know, I mean, you know, we're, I mean, his, the, 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 the corruption case, again, including the, you know, the sort of French makeup, you know, uh, company. Like there was, there was some actually merit in it, but the fact that they were investigated and the Valley brothers were investigated and, you know, and, and, and sentenced, I mean, it was clearly politically motivated uh, because there's all these schemes, you know, exist like that. Essentially, you know, it was like a kind of a, 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 a like a scheme to uh, kick, a kickback scheme, you know, running th business through a kind of a, a personal company uh, and, 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 and giving kickbacks to yourself. I mean, these things exist in Russia and like not everyone's getting, uh, uh, investigated for them or even convicted. So obviously it's political. I mean, I don't know with this prisoner of conscience business. Like I think it's, you know, just the whole, the whole concept is, is pretty, is just ludicrous, you know, to, to, to draw these hard different distinctions and pretend like it's not political. It's still stupid. I mean, obviously it's a political, it's a political statement to, to call someone a prisoner of conscience. And the fact that you find some, you know, uh, like it, I'm kind of surprised that they, that they were that Amnesty International actually, um, caved so easily based on like a tweet thread that, you know, Katya wrote, it's actually <laughs> how fucking incompetent they are. You know, it's like, like, so, um, so it's just, it's pretty funny. I mean, um, 
but yeah, I think it's look. Navalny is an interesting is an interesting character. You know, he so there's so much of his stuff that he he's like written over the years because he he kind of uh, you know he rose up as a kind of as an internet troll or as an internet blogger. You know, he he first uh, gained a, a big influence in Russia as a as a as a blogger, like in this live journal community, which was um, you know a very vibrant um, blogging community in Russia. Um, that actually a lot of authors and, and politicians came out of, and he and he used that to kind of ride um, a popularity wave as and, and became known as a as an anti-corruption um, sort of campaigner and, and a blogger, almost like a kind of a green wall, you know, type of type of he like the kind of vibe that he had on there. It's like the, the sort of the manic, never end, never never ending kind of stream of consciousness blogs that just you pumping out all the time. That's how he was, and so and so he's he's got this. So and then he was all very very uh, active in the comment section. So you'd always reply to people, and so he's always replying with some racist shit or some you know homophobic slurs, some something against the Jews. And so it's like it's like and he's to his credit, he's refused to delete that stuff. And so it's like his his um, career as a blogger as is totally you know a, like I don't even know. It's he's there's a, there's a mania to his writing. You know like like like. Um, you know filled with grammatical mistakes you know bad punctuation it's just like it's almost like stream of consciousness stuff and he was very prolific so like yeah he's he's just left behind a whole trail of all these things you know and that's not even you know that that and so that's before he got really big and began to kind of tone down that stuff and he's never you know but he's yeah well, it shows what the West wants versus the reality of Russia and how they just cannot accept an organic, even an organic Russian opposition figure that has street cred or maybe some street cred in urban areas or yeah. whatever, they can't accept it. They So Masha Gessen has to go out and whitewash him and pretend that he's like this Russian Martin Luther King figure in the New Yorker. And they're just freaking out over Katya. They've, they've, she's had to lock no. her Twitter account. She's like in a bunker. I don't know. They're dunk, I, they've doxed her. There's like threats against her life. There's threat. There, there's like these Russian, you know, journalists, you know, also like Russian American journalists are like trying to turn her into the Department of Homeland Security and the IRS. And like, it's just, it's pretty nuts. It was like the biggest story in Russia in, 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 in Russia, in Russia. I mean, I don't know. I've never seen a freak out and we like got that. Blamed. I don't think ever. We yeah, got blamed, you, got blamed you know, and then somehow Masha Gessen winds up linking to my piece on Reuters, the BBC and Bellingcat being like British yeah. foreign office cutouts. And I know. <laughs> we, we should it's give it's a little credit to, we should give some credit to our colleague, Aaron Mate, because yeah, I'm about he did, to. He did, who's being smeared for doing something called journalism. I mean, as any journalist yeah. should do, he followed up on this and he was emailing people in Amnesty and that was that was distorted and portrayed as this great Kremlin conspiracy because Aaron has been one of the leading skeptics of Russiagate and he was the one who was the one, was following up as a journalist and he posted the statement on Twitter. So then they, I mean, it's just so insane how they distorted it. No, all. I know. <laughs> No, I know. And and uh, yeah, exactly. And you guys got dragged into it as like some kind of part of some kind of grand Kremlin conspiracy to write a tweet thread, um, you know, basically pulling together all these really racist things that Navalny no, said yeah, over the years. You don't get it. We, we went back in time with the time machine, time machine and hacked <laughs> and hacked his political campaign and posted those racist videos that he made where he's like calling for people to like shoot or smash like smash Central Asian <laughs> immigrants with a shoe or shoot them, like <laughs> spray them, like yeah. spray them with Zyklon B or something. Like he's yeah, like, yeah, he's got a bunch of those ads that he's that he created for the uh, the, the organization that he co-founded, um, which is like a, a kind of a Russia for Russians white nationalist outfit. That um, yeah, he made a several videos comparing. Uh, uh, migrants from the, the the caucuses basically like um at, to insects to like uh bacteria that cause cavity and all this stuff that need to be eradicated through chemical warfare and to be shot and you know swatted like some kind of inf insect that they are i well, mean it's look like, it's it's yeah it's like when you it's, bust these narratives like when we started busting russia gate all of a sudden the attacks are just ferocious and then you bust uh the syrian narrative and the white helmets and then bellingcat and now yeah. Navalny, it's like, okay, well, Navalny maybe is different than the other three institutions or people that I, I named, but you can, what, when, when, when those attacks come down and you see how intense they are and who's waging them and the conspiratorial bogus nature, 
baseless nature of the attacks, how McCarthyite they are, that they're trying to link you to the Kremlin because what Katia wrote a few op-eds for RT. She also wrote for Radio Free Europe. But exactly. Uh, no, yeah, realize hard. you realize that millions and millions of dollars have been invested in these agitprop schemes. And just with a Twitter thread or a few articles, you just just you just destroyed yeah. that. You can puncture it. And well, and it really isn't about Navalny or Russian politics at all. I mean, really, it's about like convincing Americans. And so it's it's like yep, yep. Amer Americans think that they need this totally like, you know, whitewashed, perfect individual that said nothing bad ever. That sort of conforms to all whatever the liberal you know norms are for for behavior at you know at the moment you know because they're always changing too. So today it's like he he can't possibly say anything about immigrants bad right. He can't possibly say anything about gays that's bad. I mean especially you know he can't say anything about anything about Jews. And he, if you show that he's he's like he's got he holds all these really uh, noxious views. Um, well, Julian Assange, though, you know, when we have to focus on him being or we have to call him a rapist and focus on him saying weird things on Twitter. Doing that and, I mean, for me, what really discount dis discredited him was the disc thing that he did, you know, to be honest. That was that that was the uh, that was the that was the op that worked on me, man. You know, when they showed him dancing in the disco, I was like, I can't I can't support. This I don't know. Guy. I thought it made him look like, you know, fun. Guy I was I'm just joking. Yeah, yeah. Holly with or something. I don't know. <laughs> I'm just joking. Yeah, no, I know. Yeah, it's uh, like I, I totally. I mean, look, you pull out the things that you think you will destroy a person, and so, and then you turn down the things, or you, you know, you suppress the qualities of of, of the people that you want to promote. And again, it has nothing to do with Russia or Russians, because if you really wanted to, you know, boost this guy in Russia and boost this guy and make him even more popular in Russia, you'd you'd actually amplify the, these things that he said, because you know, I mean, to, to be honest, um, yeah, you know, that's the, true. The, the views of all the olds are you know pretty mainstream in russia like to be kind of homophobic casually you know pretty mainstream to be casually um racist and to think that like all these migrants from central asia are fucking destroying your country and possibly raping your women you know it's 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 totally normal to, to think that way and it doesn't even matter what segment of, segment of society it is it's everyone from the working class up to you know professionals at big tech companies you know basically believe these things and, and and talk that way to each other and so like so if you actually if you're you know if, if you want to run a successful successful op to convince russians to support navalny you'd actually amplify this thing so it's actually <laughs> not about russia and it's not about navalny it's about americans and like and and getting america to support whatever the foreign policy is you know, the american government into yeah into they have to believe there's an opposition figure who can be installed instead of Putin and that they can get behind and that it helps. Yeah. And Navalny's name was completely unknown among the people, many of the people who are now agitating for him before this poisoning incident, which just raises so yeah. many questions in my mind. Well, well Yasha, Yasha, this is actually a good segue. I wanted to ask you really quickly. I, well, I was going to say before that Max mentioned, you know, that these, there's these figures like Navalny, like Juan Guaido, like in Ecuador, Yacu Perez, who are cultivated over years. And then if you expose them, then all of the anger comes down on you. And for my reporting in Ecuador, I've seen something very similar happen with this massive smear campaign using very similar tactics. But but as for Navalny, really quickly, I mean, you talked about kind of who his constituency are, the kind of the upper middle class, you know, pro-Western liberals, although there, there's different groups that support him, but that's probably the kind of the main constituency. But really quickly, can can we just talk about where he lies in the the kind of larger context of Russian politics? Because this is something I've seen you tweet about, and not a lot of people in the U.S. understand, and even people, you know, who are anti-imperialist and who oppose, you know, these clear regime change operations and destabilization operations, sometimes they say really stupid stuff, especially when it comes to Russian politics, mostly because so many people on the Russian political spectrum are pretty right wing. So in the context of where Putin lies, where other opposition groups to Putin lie, where Navalny is on the spectrum, can you kind of explain, you know, where the different p politics are? Because, you know, there, there's this attempt by the kind of the Russia gate liberals and some of these like anarcho spook characters like Alexander Reed Ross, who want us to think that Vladimir Putin is a, is a secret fascist who wants to bring back the Third Reich and like national Bolshevism or whatever, which is ridiculous. Mm -hmm. 
But then there are people, I remember you saw that some, you were joking that some people claim that Putin was a socialist because in Russia, healthcare is way better than in the US, which is obviously also a joke. I mean, that's he's yeah. not a socialist. He's, he's a capitalist. He's a conservative. So talk about like, in the context of Russian politics, where is Putin? Where is Navalny? And where are the other? And, and, and you talk about Jiranovsky. I mean, in the 90s, the big fear was that someone like Jiranovsky was actually going to take power yeah. until until Putin came along and kind of held that held the yeah. line. I mean, look, it's hard. To, it's hard to draw a clear line between, you know, what these two people believe. You know, Putin is uh, I mean, you know, like it, they're, they're they're like f f I mean, OK, so just very broadly, um, both the opposition and and sort of the Kremlin sort of patronage networks that they are opposing, both of them are broadly neoliberal. You know, they, they, they're so like that's the baseline, you know, and so you can sort of like then tweak the, the dial to, into different into different into different directions, meaning like some of them are like are conservative neoliberal and some of them are neoliberal, but like support these oligarchy patronage networks and are a part of it so that they're with the, the Putin clan. And so the people who are outside of those patronage networks, but they're in their neoliberal and maybe they were, maybe they were part of these patronage networks in the nineties or that they were sort of oligarchs who um, were not part of these patronage networks, but like came up because they were really successful on their own right. And like, you know, be, built, you know, these kind of like successful businesses without necessarily getting, you know, chunks of the Soviet state privatized to them. Right. Like the like one like this guy, this libertarian backer of Navalny that lives in the UK now that I wrote about. He's one of these guys who you know built this really successful, basically a store that sells mobile phones. That you know is the largest uh, mobile phone store chain in Russia. You know he essentially got the business taken away from him, and he had to you know uh, buy these like more Kremlin patronage oligarchic networks, right? And so he's pissed off at the at the ruling elite now because he, they basically took away his business, you know? And so, so you have, but on, but, uh, but fundamentally they all believe in neoliberalism or ver ver versions of neoliberalism. They believe in the primacy of the markets. They believe that they believe in um, privatized in, 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 they don't believe in, 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 in the kind of a so socializing politics. They believe that, you know, private individuals should have, you know, uh, power to sort of to to run society and so you know with, with kremlin it's a little different because there's a kind of a a kind of a you know i don't even know what you call it, like a, a king oligarch or something or like a top oligarch in, in in putin that sort of mediates between all these different clans and so and ha gives a bit more gives some weight into what's best for the national interest you know um and what's what's and how to like sort of keep you know yourself in power uh, by distributing some of the, the wealth to, to, to sort of the, you know, to the peasants, essentially. Um, but like, but they're, but, but broadly speaking, they're all neoliberal. And so it's hard to know what, you know, Navalny believes. You know, Navalny has changed his position, you know, a couple of times. And he's kind of moved towards almost like a more of a Bernie Sanders types of sort of social, socialist populism or whatever, where he talks about, you know, increasing salaries, um, you know, increasing uh, sal funding for health care. Uh, and doing all these things, increasing the minimum wage, um, things like that. But again, it's, it's, it's very difficult to know what he believes because he, first of all, changes his positions all the time. But uh, I mean, one thing that's pretty obvious, if you look at his supporters and the people who support Ru Navalny within Russia, they're all very, they're all neoliberal. And the people who oppose him, you know, sort of the Putin's oligarchic cl clans and the patronist networks, they're all neoliberal as well, um, except that they're the ones in power and have control of the country's wealth and so i don't think that you know him coming to him coming to power let's say navalny comes to power i don't know what he would actually change you know because we know what, what happens when you well, implement a neoliberal neoliberal political system i mean we see it in america you have like rampant corruption you have a you know the creation of an oligarchy you have the monopolization of 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 the most important services in a society uh, you have a few people owning all the wealth and controlling it. So if his idea is to create like a clean, you know, fair neoliberalism, we know where that leads. You know, it's 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 a myth, obviously. You know, and and so so, you know, the the, the hopes that people pin on Navalny, you know, and and actually it's interesting because there's there's a left wing there's left wing groups in in Russia that are pretty marginal, pretty small. You know, they've some of them have kind of thrown in with Navalny because they think that. Um, they don't agree with his politics. They don't agree with his neoliberalism. They don't agree with his um, sort of nationalism and his anti-immigrant positions. But they think that he's a catalyst that is ex ex 
igniting a kind of a, uh, for the first time in years, a, a political movement of some kind, right? And I don't, they don't, I don't want to be left behind. Yeah. So I don't, I don't agree with their really, position at all, but that's what they believe. I don't know if I think it's, I don't know if it's fair to just paint them all with the neoliberal brush and say, well, Putin's a neoliberal. Yes. He, he comes out of that network in St. Petersburg uh, that pushed capitalism on Russia under Gorbachev and so on. But he's, it, it, I, I think it's a little more complicated than that. I mean, uh, Gennady Zuganov, who's the head of the commun Russian Communist Party, which is like the second largest opposition party, has called Navalny essentially a front for Western financial capital, Western financial interests. And I think that's where the key lies is that what Putin has done in uh, screwing over and shirking Berezovsky uh, in prosecuting Khodorkovsky is he's organized a kind of national group of oligarchs. And I mean, uh, Gil Doctorow calls him a state capitalist, which is what like Trotsky has called China. But there is an element of state control over the oligarchy or organization of the oligarchy. And there is an element of uh, economic planning where the economy is still functioning to some degree along the lines of Russian national interests. Putin has introduced a very ambitious infrastructure program, which he might not be able to pay for and which Western sanctions aim to prevent. And there's also the issue of Russia working together with China to defeat the do dominant power of the dollar, which allows the US and the West to sanction any country they want. They're trying to create an alternative SWIFT system. Uh, Putin's speech at Davos, which was completely overlooked in Western media, was very interesting. He talked about how dangerous big tech is and how big tech monopolies need to be broken up, how uh, the future will be determined by counter hegemonic powers being able to compete with uh, big tech monopolies. He essentially denounced neoliberalism as I understand it, while of course he's embracing a sort of national form of the free market. And I think you give someone like Navalny in power, who, as you said, was a monomaniacal blogger, that the, the idea is that he will have no idea how to run government. Whereas Putin is someone who comes from the intelligence world, understands geopolitics very well, I mean, you can say what you want about him. He's not someone that I have a political affinity for, but he certainly yeah. handled Russia's Russia's uh, interests very well on the world stage. And seems Russia seems much more like an adult in the room than the U.S. when it moves into uh, when it when it deals with its near abroad. Um, so that's what the U.S. wants: is to get someone who's just a complete doofus who has no idea and then needs coaching. Uh, it would be like. I don't. I wouldn't think a uh, Navalny administration would be any different than a Saakashvili administration in Georgia. It would yeah. just be a complete clown show, which is what we want. Yeah, I mean, look, I don't even know. I, I think that Navalny is, is in a way a mystery because I think that um, he um, could very well go a, a kind of a, a Putin way, which is to, you know, um, I mean, successfully or not is not. It's not clear if he would be able to do it. But like what Putin did is he replaced a kind of a. a, a Free for all oligarchic uh, plunder of of the Soviet Union and division of its assets, um, with uh, a, a, a managed plunder uh, and division of its assets, uh, with like oligarchs that are his are his buddies and are, that's his inner circle. Uh, and so, um, it, so it is like a state neoliberal, I guess, but it's still neoliberal in the sense that he believes he doesn't believe that the answer to things is to have. You know, a kind of socialized uh, society where people are involved politically, and and that people um, have, uh, and that sort of the public will or the the democracy and in this kind of way can actually influence and run society. It's like private interests run society. It's just that these private interests are sort of capped by a kind of a nominal sort of national security interest uh, umbrella and a national interest umbrella in which he and his kind of crew is in charge of. But like. Actually, the, the the guts of of of, of the Russian economy is pri privatized. It's private, you know. So you take and so you you control it a little bit, and you don't like, and you siphon off a bit of money and put it into the budget, and you know put it into um, infrastructure projects and things like that. But even those infrastructure projects are built 
and carried out by private companies that skim huge amounts of money off 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 the budget and it, you know there's an the existence of, of, of an oligarchy and so i think it's the idea is the primacy of the market um uh, is what makes it kind of neoliberal they believe in the, in the market they believe in the market ideology so All i I'm think that's that what makes Putin it restored the primacy of the kremlin whereas in the yeah 90s. he did and i mean I, and i don't know what navalny will do i mean navalny could come in and he could become a, a kind of a russian nationalist you know if you actually think look at what he's written about and what his earliest politics are which is are about restoring Russia's greatness. You know, it's about like making Russia great again <laughs> for Russians. You know, it could very much be a, a kind of a, a national, heavy national security state that like, you know, uh, terrorizes it, it, mi migrants and that, you know, like elevates Russians to some kind of higher status or Slavs to some kind of higher status. And that has a very a kind of a mixed, you know, s social oriented uh, oligarchy, you know, that, that actually cares about the, the the national interest from some kind of nationalist perspective you know from some kind of ethno almost like clinton level uh, yeah so it's a bit of a uh, uh, freudian slip there it's a uh, yeltsin era um neoliberals you know that with the kind of yeltsin era ideas about about how to govern society but i actually don't you know i actually don't know what what the society that Navalny would build would look like, and nobody knows. I mean, it's all so. It's, right now, it's all just projections on him. I mean, he clearly isn't. Um, he clearly uh, is, is nationalistic, and so um, I, I and I don't know how that would impact uh, the kind of the, the the people that he would gather around himself to create to create a, a new Russia, and how that would actually change things. I mean, it actually might look a lot like Putin's Russia. He just with slightly different people running the the, the kind of patronage, patronage networks, you know? Um, so, I mean, you know, once Navalny comes to power and then like becomes more like Putin and, you know, he'd be again demonized and there'd be like another another opposition character that they, you know, dig up from somewhere that is, you know, again, pure and is against this kind of, uh, is, is against Navalny, you know? So I actually don't know. And so it's hard, it's hard, it's hard to say. Um, and I don't think anyone knows. And, and right now it's all just pure projection on him. Well, well, Yasha, I want to switch to the, the final topic of the stream before uh, we cut. We're at an hour and a half here, but it's I got to see... actually jump off. But aren't there some some patron questions, too? Yeah, yeah. And so Max is going to is going to leave here and, and we're going to spend a bit more time with Yasha. And he and I are going to talk about big tech, which is one of his other big the other big topics that he covers and talk about you know, Silicon Valley and mass surveillance and the U.S. national security state. So I guess, Max, do you want to leave any parting words? Well, yeah. Subscribe to Yasha's Substack. Thanks. I, I, I was one of the first subscribers and I definitely don't regret it. And uh, one of the best things about Yasha is like, even if you think you agree with him, he'll find a way to make you argue with him. So <laughs> it's never is never a boring moment. And, oh, thank uh, you, Max. That's a that's a big compliment coming from you. <laughs> Thanks for joining us. And, uh, Thanks, man. Yeah, Take care. Up. All right. Peace. All right. Great. So it's just Yasha finally we got that now. fucker out of here. Now we can now we can get down <laughs> to business. Yeah. Yasha and me sounds I, like can you swear on your live stream. I guess you can. I've been yeah. swearing. Oh yeah, and you've already, you've already done it like like dozens of fucking times. So I'm no, sorry. Yeah. Like yeah. I just have a, I've, I've just, I was brought up on the, on the mean streets of San Francisco, you know, in my immigrant ghetto. So I just have a, I swear a lot. No, it's good. I'm, I'm very pro swearing. And I have to say Yasha and me, I was going to say, sounds like a, like a nineties buddy movie, like a B buddy. Yasha movie. And me. Yasha. <laughs> but it's but, like, um, you know, it's like some kind of like a little magical, um, it'd be like a, I'd be like your imaginary, uh, um, friend. He was like a furry, pet or something you know like a like a furry a furry dragon named yasha dragon with a, a big beard so it's yeah. it's yasha and me now okay we're gonna take a pause there this is the end of part two of our interview with the journalist yasha levine definitely come back and check out part three you can listen to a podcast version or watch it on YouTube, we will be talking about big tech corporations, Silicon Valley, and how they're so inextricably linked to the US government, the US national security state, and the first Cold War. If you like the journalism we do here, if you wanna support this show, please consider going to patreon.com slash moderate rebels. And as always, thanks for listening.